Hello to everyone who's joined us so far. We're going to give the other attendees a few minutes to make their way over. Right, I think we can get started now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the launch of our Moving the Needle Stewardship in India research. We are delighted to have you here all today. To ensure a smooth process, we're going to mention some house rules. Firstly, we would appreciate if your microphones could be muted and your cameras remain off throughout the webinar. Um, please use the Zoom chat feature if you require any technical assistance. And similarly, if you have any questions related to the research, we encourage you to send them via the Q&A functionality on Zoom. We hope to answer all questions at the end of the webinar. Um, if we don't have enough time to go through all of them, we will address them with you via email. Um, you will also receive an email of the report and a recording of this webinar tomorrow. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you find the webinar insightful and thought provoking. Let's get started. Over to you, Glenn. Thank you, Courtney. And again, I'd like to echo a welcome, a very warm welcome, and many thanks for joining us. Uh, the team here are very excited to be presenting this research. It's been three and a half months of very intense work, and we think we have something very interesting, unique uh, to share, which will both benefit you and hopefully you will enjoy as well. For those who don't know Riscura well, but even those who have had exposure to us, I thought a little bit of background on the company would be helpful. In terms of assets, a very substantial company. We've got three broad areas, advice and reporting with about 165 billion US dollars, assets under management approaching $4 billion, and then assets under administration of just over 5 billion. So we, we're, we're a significant player. We consider ourselves to be experts in emerging markets and frontier marks, markets. We have 12 global offices, now, the leadership team have been together for 23 years with a staff complement now over 170 people, and we research over 750 asset managers. So a substantial firm, and uh, yeah. These are the two people who will be presenting today, myself, Glenn Silverman, investment strategist, and I'm also director of the investment business. I'm Johannesburg-based. I've been in the investment game for well over 30 years. In 2014, I co-authored a book on the BRICS, so that's Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa called Moving the Needle. And therefore, I was exposed then to India in quite a big way. I have a very strong passion and interest for the country, which hopefully will come through as well. And my colleague Faisal will be joining me too. He is London-based. He's the head of our investment research area, 24 years of experience in investment markets and managers. And he'll be sharing the presentation with me. Just in terms of what I'm tending to cover will be the introduction. Important to start with why India? Why have we done the research? What is the relevance? I've picked one slide of macroeconomic data, but I think all of it very relevant to what we'll be discussing here and really sets the scene for the discussion. Let's talk about stewardship. How do we define it? Why is it important? Why are we focusing on it? I want to give a bit of the background too and details around the series, which we've called Moving the Needle some high-level observations from our discussions in India, and then we're going to delve into the findings themselves. There are six key findings with many sub-themes beneath it. Uh, Faisal will ha handle the first three of those, the more detailed and meaty ones. I have the next three thereafter, and then a final slide in terms of some suggestions we may have in terms of moving the needle forward, making a real difference, and we'll throw open to Q&A, time permitting. So in terms of India and some important facts and figures, and to me, these are mind blowing. A population of 1.4 billion people, now the largest in the world. That's a recent case because India recently overtook China, which was until then the largest population in the world. And obviously this gap will continue to open up as India is quite a young country, um, having a lot more babies. China is on the other side, net uh, people falling out of, for example, the labor force each year. 
so that gap will open up further. Rural population is very significant. 900 million people estimated to be there. So the rains matter, agriculture matters, land matters a great deal. Only 60 million people are formally employed out of 1.4 billion. That says a lot in and of itself. And I thought a fascinating statistic. In terms of GDP, uh, India is ranked as number five largest in the world. These are out of approximately 180 countries with a GDP of 3.2 trillion rand. The number beneath it is the GDP per capita. And I find this fascinating. It comes up twice in the slide. Once you're dividing that GDP, which is huge, by such a large number of people, GDP per capita is actually very, very low, ranking 146 in the world. So well behind just about everyone else. The stock market cap is very similar to the size of the economy, $3.3 trillion. It too is number five in the world and there's some jostling often around that position. But as an example, a very long, proud history and pedigree of being listed, the Bombay stock market then named, opened in 1875. So in two years time, it will have a 150 year track record, which is most impressive and even uh, 12 years, open 12 years before the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. We're talking about stewardship today and therefore corruption is an important discussion in this discussion. In terms of the Corruption Perception Index, uh, India is ranked number 85 in the world, not a wonderful position to be, but I thought since India is part of the BRICS and I wrote a book on the BRICS, that I would contrast that to the other BRICS. So the worst of all, the worst ranked of the BRICS is Russia in terms of this Corruption Perception Index at 137, then Brazil, position 94. India would then slot into the third position with South Africa and China being a little bit better. But obviously, corruption is a concern and an issue within emerging markets. In terms of carbon emissions, India is the third worst in the world. That's behind China and the United States of America. But once again, when you divide it by the number of people, in terms of per capita emission, only ranked number 133. So it is a, a big emitter. It is a problem, but you know, on a per capita basis, much lower. India has more recently committed to its net zero commitment by 2070, which is very interesting. The earliest that I've seen of certain countries committing to 2035, the majority around 2050, and 2070 is one of the last in the, one of the, the, the latest in the world. I think themselves in Ghana, not the only two uh, committing so late. So recognizing the fact that it's an emerging market, that fossil fuels are around for some period of time to come, that they need to grow the economy and the wealth they are, many, many unemployed people, high levels of poverty as well. And so India have set a target much later than many others. In terms of stewardship, what is stewardship itself? Uh, the technical de definition, the job of supervising or taking care of something, it starts to describe it well. But from institutional investor, it's the use of influence to maximize overall long-term value. And I've highlighted long-term because this is about taking a long-term position. It's not about next quarter's performance or returns. We're talking about much longer time frames than that. And we'll elaborate on that a bit later. Why is it important? Well, to my mind, this is kind of the holy grail. Because if you could get a tool, which this is to one, minimize risk, two, preserve long-term shareholder value, and three, enhance long-term returns, you have the perfect combination. And stewardship does hold up that potential. Why is it relevant for asset managers? And we have asset managers, we had a call this morning, and this is our second call today, many have attended, um, because they have a key role as stewards of institutional savings. You have an asset owner, and they typically would delegate that authority around those assets to an asset manager, and then they expect the asset manager to do something with it. So the two key facets of stewardship are the need to engage with the underlying investing companies and secondly, to vote their proxies. So talking about our series, our series is focused on exactly that. It's the state of stewardship in some key emerging countries. I'll detail which those countries are and we're covering both engagement and proxy voting. And what we really trying to understand and assess the current state of affairs. Firstly, what is the typical manager's attitude and their approach towards stewardship? And then secondly, are they just paying lip service? Are they ticking the box or are they actually moving the needle? Are they making a real difference? And I think those are two very important questions to answer 
to ask and answer. And then we've suggested some ways that managers may move the needle further. So this is the journey that Rescure has undertaken in the stewardship space. It starts a long time ago in 2011, where we put out our first initial report called the Sport Votes in South Africa. It was a South Africa only study. It was launched then to coincide with the launch of another important element in, in the ESG space called CRISA 1.0, the Code for Responsible Investing in South Africa. And this particular report that we put out only dealt with proxy voting. As I've said, we've expanded the series now to talk about engagement as well. And 10 years after the first report, we introduced our first Moving the Needle report being stewardship in South Africa in 2021. Now we did it in 21 because CRISA, that same code for responsible investing was intending to launch the, the new updated version, CRISA 2.0 that year. And so we thought we'd align it as we had done with the first report. As it so happens, we managed to get our presentation before the actual relaunch of CRISA 2.0. We followed up the South Africa one in 22 with a similar report in China. And now we are presenting our stewardship in India report. We are discussing and debating and proposing what we might do next year. And what we're thinking that might be a very useful opportunity to do what we call the comparison report. So differences between differences, uh, benefits, uh, um, pros and cons between South Africa, China, and India. Uh, so we're not covering that in today's presentation. Many have asked you know, for, for some of the differences and similarities between the countries, but that's not the focus of today's presentation. So to give you a bit of a high level summary of this project, it's been a global team effort over the past three and a half months. So members, many members of the South African team, our UK team, our US team. Um, it's been a combination of surveys. So we interviewed 35 asset managers. There were about 29 questions that we sent out to them. We also had a series of one-on-one -on -one interviews. There were 12 of those with 12 different managers, but actually a few more than that, because sometimes we went back to manager just to you know, check and test our thinking, and then a whole lot of desktop research as well. Today, we're having these two webinars. This is the second of them. We release some of the, the highlights of our report, um, and that report too will be released today and be available on our website. Now, I'd like to suggest to those people who have an interest in the space to actually go onto our website and, and download that report or we'll read the report. It has so much more detail than we could possibly cover in a 45 minute odd presentation. And I wanna give you some insight in the next slide of some of the stuff that we won't be presenting today. Just one of the annexures, which I think is, is very rich and very beautiful. And all of this really builds on and augments our experience in researching both emerging markets and managers. So here's annexure 5.1, there are three others. And this one focuses, this is the timeline of the key corporate governance developments within India starting 1992 up to date. It is a wonderful story and an amazing summary and very quick reading, which I cannot cover unfortunately on this court would take too long, but to those who have an interest in the space, I would highly recommend getting the report. This is an example of something in the report that we won't be covering in detail in this presentation. So what are some of our high level observations of the past three and a half months of doing this research? The first one, was how easy it was to engage with these managers. They were very open to engage with ourselves. They spoke good English, which was help, which was helpful. We found the terms of reference very, very familiar, which in the case of China, this would be different. They spoke a different language, uh, saw the world possibly differently. It just, uh, you know, we needed the expertise of our Chinese office team to be able to handle some of those meetings. We came up with the fact that India has some fairly unique features, which we'll talk about today. Just a different, just a different feeling and taste and, and, and uniqueness about India, which is true in their food and true in their people, but very true in the stewardship space as well. For many, joining the PRI, which used to be called the United Nations Principle for Responsible Investing, now shortened PR, PRI, was often a defining event. Now that would only have happened three to five years ago. So for many of the Indian managers, the whole ESG space is fairly new. Many of them have only recently started fully fledged uh, ESG teams with heads of teams, et cetera. So that was very interesting to us. Data is increasingly important. It's been hard to come by in the ESG space. 
Because of some of the regulatory changes we'll talk about a bit later, it's becoming a lot more available and will continue to do so. And so we expect to see further development in the space over time. Much of what is done in ESG space is very sector specific. So questions that you might ask or data that you may get or require would differ very, very strongly if you're in a manufacturing company versus a mining company, a consumer company, or for example, an area where India is very big, IT services. The tone is always set from the top. And like him or, or, or not, Modi and his government have been reformers. They've made a lot of change, and these changes have been very, very positive. A lot of that has been through the regulators, which actually score very highly in the comments from our managers, and also the tone that is set by corporates as well. Across the board, we found that the trends are moving in the right directions, whether that be the regulators, the companies themselves, or the asset managers around it. So that was a pretty big tick as well. And then we were informed that there's quite a big difference in terms of the way this is thought about between state owned enterprises versus the privately owned now public companies. And we only focused on the latter. So none of what we speak about here is a focus on, on state owned enterprises. So what do we hope to get out of today's session? Firstly, we're going to present the findings from our research. We hope that for yourselves and certainly for us, it's an enhanced understanding of the local industry. We're looking to improve industry best practice and behavior for the better with the ultimate goal of making key mar emerging markets more gl globally competitive from all perspectives, but certainly from an ESG responsible investing one, safer, better, more investable. So we're trying to kind of co-design a better future for all. So that really sets the scene. I'm going to hand over to my colleague Faisal then to take you through the first of the findings and then I'll come back. I'm going to be controlling the slides, so I'll be looking for the right time to do so. Over to you, Faisal. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, good morning uh, or good afternoon to, to all of you. Uh, my name is Faisal Rafi. I'm responsible for research at Riscura. Uh, been leading a lot of the work uh, that we do in emerging markets. Um, as Glenn said, uh, our findings are split into six, sec six segments that we're going to go into more uh, detail now. Uh, one key takeaway is, is really all the findings here are a summation of what we got from the fund managers. We've got to keep out our own views out of this, this, this presentation. Uh, furthermore, just one of the things out of the 30 plus uh, managers that we did survey, they, 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 we did a stratified sample to make sure that the world spread between you know, Indian mutual funds that are managing local money, Indian managers that are money, managing international money, as well as global asset managers uh, that manage Indian uh, specific uh, equities. Uh, maybe we can just dive straight into the details. Uh, Glenn, you could just change the slide. Um, so really, I think, I think uh, having a significant uh, controlling shareholder in listed companies is, is reasonably common uh, across emerging markets, uh, especially you know the prominence of state-owned enterprises, uh, you get that across the board. I think where 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 India is really uh, what we found India being very unique and different is this importance of family-run and controlled companies uh, that are listed in, in India, all the way ranging from smaller companies to the largest uh, companies. Uh, locals refer to 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 the, this controlling shareholders promoter. And, and, and typically what you have is family members uh, will be in prominent positions, senior management, CEO, CFO roles, often the CEO, the chairman will be the same people. They will have control, complete control over the board. Um, and, 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 and that's a good thing if you, if you, if you really do have a good, uh, good family behind, uh, uh, behind the company that, that has an ability to create a shareholder value both for themselves as well as their uh, minority um, shareholders. But on the flip side, um, if uh, they do tend out to be bad actors, there's not much one can do to stop them. Uh, and, and, and therefore, avoiding promoters uh, that could be bad actors is absolutely critical and one of the most important emphases uh, for, for, for fund managers. Uh, and uh, they, uh, they are not shy to not hold any shares in a company, regardless of size, if they believe uh, that 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 the governance uh, of the company or the or the controlling shareholder 
um, is has a potential to be bad. Um, and 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 what we found um, really interesting was when we really started talking to fund managers about how they deal with the very largest of companies. So uh, at the time during the survey, uh, Adani group of companies was very prominent in global media. Uh, this is a company uh, involved in a lot of different industries, uh, including um, transition to green, green energy. Uh, uh, its share price did incredibly well over the previous few years uh, until uh, beginning of this year, um, a report came out from a fund manager in the US called Hindenburg, uh, which uh, led to accusations of, of, of some uh, bad practices uh, and, and led to an incredible collapse uh, of, the, of the share price. Uh, during this period, really, I mean, um, and during the up, up years, there were a lot of fund managers who, who uh, uh, noted uh, not holding any of Adani's shares being as, as a big contributor to their underperformance, uh, but, but they were very willing to not touch, um, uh, touch it. Actually, you'll go, go further, out of all the uh, 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 managers we surveyed, none of them actually held, any, uh, held or ever held uh, shares uh, in Adani Group. Um, unless it was mandates that were restricted uh, by either being passive or kind of semi semi passive uh, type uh, type mandates, and and this was really interesting. So then we started exploring with the fund manager why 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 is Adani different to other family control companies, uh, other companies that have poor corporate governance, but they're willing to hear hold shares in those companies, and 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 that's where where there's a real real distinction coming through uh, in differentiation between corporate governance and then uh, the ability of the family and the promoters uh, uh, to manage the business uh, in a sustainable way, uh, creating long-term shareholder value and you know, do, you know, putting the capital to work uh, uh, well and, and demonstrating that, uh, that track record. Another thing that came upon was, was managers are willing uh, to to back change, positive change. So in this uh, Reliance Industries schema, for example, where um, which is the largest uh, listed company in, in the Indian stock market, about 10% of the MSCI India index, uh, and and there uh, it was you know quite noteworthy that 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 uh, managers uh, distinctly saw an improvement in 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 kind of providing more information to shareholders, uh, doing more. Uh, uh, shareholder friend, friendly activities, as well as improving the governance practices, and managers were willing to uh, are willing to back uh, that that kind of a change. So here you go. I mean, this is this is uh, this is uh, what uh, managers would like, to, what typically do uh, with uh, uh, with bad actors, and you can see that that overwhelming uh, number of the respondents said they'd rather hold none of that stock. I mean, this is this is quite quite. Uh, you know, this this does take a lot of conviction because often what happens is bad actors could, uh, because they might be taking shortcuts in the business. Those businesses at the you know at the surface level could show incredible returns, and the share price will reflect that over many years uh, before that party ends. Uh, and that can, especially if it's companies that are big constitutes of the index in emerging markets, that can lead to a, a quite a, quite a big detractor from returns for quite a long time. Uh, so, so being willing not to hold any is, is quite a um, uh, quite a conviction, and and and, and should uh, you know, sh and ma the Indian asset management industry should uh, be given credit for that. So coming with uh, to how managers like to to engage. Now, firstly, we've already talked about it. There's not much you can do if you are partnered with a bad actor in the first place. So, so. Understanding who you're partnering with and avoiding uh, a, 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 the wrong promoters first and foremost. Uh, however, uh, and then furthermore, uh, like other parts of Asia, Indian managers also prefer to avoid confrontation. Uh, that's kind of you know endemic to, to culture across Asia. Uh, however, we did see more uh, ability to have difficult conversations than say compared to China. Uh, where where that is just completely avoided at any cost. Uh, where managers do engage with companies, they prefer face to face engagement, uh, and uh, and and they do prefer to engage directly 
uh, although collaboration between managers is increasing, especially around the areas of climate change, uh, where uh, where you've got you know some of the biggest uh, polluters part of the climate action hundred plus, and managers are working together with the company uh, to 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 all collaborating together to for them to put into uh, put in good long term uh, plans in place. Oh, I just wanted to say uh, what also is quite. Uh, important to note is that um, uh, uh, where there is a lot of engagement with smaller companies, and there's some good good case studies of, of where that's really helped, uh, that's no, uh, no surprise. Um, and, and typically when things do go wrong, uh, where, where management starts digressing from the main cause, then th whilst the managers will try to engage but their first uh, first action of plan is to significantly cut, cut, uh, cut their shareholding or potentially uh, even exe uh, exit. So the top graph here uh, shows you how fund managers really like to deal, uh, have to face-to-face -face interaction with the key leaders uh, in the company. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing a lot across emerging markets, including in India, is to kind of um, explain to fund managers that every letter to the CEO and management does count. So uh, here, uh, what often happens is a smaller fund manager might say, well, if we write that letter to a large company, uh, what's the point? And, and, and one of the key points to note, and we've seen this before and elsewhere, is, is every letter sent adds to the pile. So, so your, your letter could be that thousand letter in a long pile, which leads uh, to the CFO to say, you know what, it's time to take action on this matter. Uh, so, so it is really important uh, to send those, uh, you know, written letters, regardless of size, and 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 we would like to see more fund managers do that if they're not 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 doing that. Um, when when it comes to engaging, I already mentioned managers like to do it themselves using their in-house staff. Uh, and what we found really unique in Indian asset managers, actually unique globally, is is it's quite common for there to be a person in the investment team whose sole job is to build networks in the business community. That we find quite rare. Normally, is, you typically have that in private equity industry, uh, less so in listed equity fund managers. But in India, you will often have someone whose sole job is to build those relationships so that they can go and, and, and vet and do reference checking, uh, but also um, engage uh, constructively. So just moving over to to the environment and social, uh, what we did uh, uh, find was, uh, you know, ESG in, 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 in India is really G with a capital uh, G followed by the E and the S. We've already talked about the importance of governance being the cornerstone of ESG um, in India. And I'll can I get into some of the more micro details in a bit. Um, when it comes to the emphasis on climate change, that's also been increasing up the agenda significantly. Uh, ben mentioned that that uh, the country uh, uh, has put in a net zero target of 2070. However, all stakeholders, whether it's the government, the fund managers, the companies, all recognize a, a few issues. Importance of energy security, the importance of fossil fuels during the transition phase and that they will remain important in India for a long time, but also the, uh, the fact that the transition to renewable energy could also help the country becoming self-sufficient in energy where currently uh, import of, of, of fossil fuels is a very, very big cost uh, to, the, uh, to the Indian economy. So from that perspective, uh, it is recognized as an important, uh, important uh, factor across the board. And there've been some great, great achievements. So to give you an example, the cement in industry in India has really got to global best uh, standards where uh, the uh, you know the cement companies in India are, are comparable to the best in the world when it comes to emissions. Uh, Reliance, which is one of the biggest emitters uh, in India, has committed to a net zero target of 2035. Uh, they've also announced a very ambitious target of uh, deploying many billions uh, into 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 renewable energy, which is great. You know you'd expect the largest to lead from the front, and that's good and important uh, to see that. Um, and, 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 and regulation is backing that up. And you know, we, we, we are expecting more and more uh, regulation that uh, uh, enforces companies to provide env environmental disclosures, and that then leads to a circular effect of 
uh, more engagement. Uh, however, I think one of the things that came across in a lot of our uh, meetings was this importance of um, this, this increased renewable energy does have social implications. You know, renewable energy is, does require a lot of land, uh, and, uh, and every patch of land is owned by someone, uh, whether it's in rural India, whether it's small, small farms or within the cities. So, so there is this, this challenge of procuring uh, you know, unter uninterrupted patches of land uh, to actually build uh, the renewable energy projects in the in the first place, and then you know one person uh, refuses to sell their homes, uh, and then you can't and that 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 potential land becomes useless. Uh, regulator, unlike government, unlike in China, can't displace those people. It's it's a it's a democracy. Uh, so then it kind of creates this deadlock. Which then means that 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 sometimes people, when there is a deadlock, people start uh, 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 turning to unethical means, uh, which is a big risk and and something that's plagued India in the past uh, when it comes to uh, procuring uh, procuring land. Saying that, um, what it does is is it it, it creates um, uh, uh, it, it it increases the time to develop these projects, uh, but it can be addressed, and there are multiple examples. Uh, of, of where this has been done sustainably, uh, where 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 companies have talked directly to the landlord owners and 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 come to very good uh, good results, and there are quite a few examples of those uh, emerging. Um, moving to the S, and this is really really interesting for us. Um, um, so when we mean by social here, is what we're, we're talking about is the responsibility of companies uh, to their stakeholders, whether it's their employees. Society, their clients, or their customers, um, and and there, you know, out of for example, out of the hundred and five written examples of engagement, we got only two uh, which related to social. One of them was a fund manager trying to uh, change, uh, uh, was trying to engage with Tata and Sons uh, to to actually remove the Sons to be more more inclusive. Uh, but 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 really, uh, there is a, a reluctance. Uh, of uh, currently so far, th there's there's not been as much progress uh, with fund managers engaging in the S issue. That's partly because of time. It's a journey. So so obviously, you know, fund managers are having to grapple with 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 the ESG concept, doing more work. Uh, you know, just the climate transition requires so much work. So it's also about fund managers going through their journey and coming down to social next. Um, uh, but it is something that needs to be uh, 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 there needs to be more effort going into that. Uh, India is a country where female participation as a percentage of the economy has been falling, uh, and uh, I mean there are many reasons for it. One of them is that you know for, uh, um, the data measurement doesn't capture it correctly. Uh, that's just one reason why that 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 comes across in the numbers. Uh, but but we've also not seen enough kind of um, uh, direct examples of engagement where fund managers are actually working uh, proactively and encouraging that. Now that now we do have regulators now specifying more uh, disclosures on things like how many females in the company that in itself should, uh, to raise the agenda. Uh, so, so we do expect progress there over time. But, and then there are areas which are far more complex and endemic to the Indian society, like caste, religion, ethnicity, uh, where we're really, um, it's, it's a subject that you know, neither companies nor Managers really uh, want to uh, want to want to talk about or prepare to talk about. Um, moving over to corporate so social responsibility, India is, I think, it's one of the few countries not really come across a major economy where where it is compulsory for companies to dedicate two percent of their net profits uh, towards uh, corporate social responsibility. That's quite unique and really great to see in India. Obviously. Uh, when you do have mandates like that, it is subject to abuse, but but largely it's uh, it's leading to uh, good work uh, being done. Um, however, uh, uh, what we did here was well, we don't have to worry about S because we're putting CSR in. CSR does not remove a company's duty to its stakeholders, and 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 we, you know we encourage managers to you know you know uh, properly engage with companies on those. Uh, so, social issues, and finally, really, you know, there are other ESG challenges in India that are unique to India: uh, scarcity of water, 
uh, there are issues of you know uh, uh, you know standards in uh, production of of medicines. Uh, there's still a lot of uh, mis-selling going on in the financial sector. So those, so a lot of those uh, came up uh, that you know we'd not you know kind of specifically raised, but the managers actually uh, uh, raised uh, themselves. So just returning to governance here, you can see uh, that that uh, generally. Uh, the areas that managers engaged with on, on, on corporate governance have been reasonably consistent, uh, the board composition being a very important one, executive compensation as well. But you can see that slight shift where the managers are now getting more assertive on, 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 on the, the more difficult question as in our know, separation of the CEO and chairman responsibility. So we are seeing fund managers getting a little bit more assertive. We're trying to engage constructively on some of the more sensitive subjects uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, the family uh, running the, the business. Next, uh, this is a slide that just shows the important environmental issues uh, in, in India. Uh, you can see you know, the climate uh, change and, and greenhouse gas emissions is, is, is a very big, one of the biggest factors, but it's also very nice to see that there's a, there's a more focus from fund managers on other areas of the environment, like increased deforestation. Um, and 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 what what was surprising is this this reduced focus on air and water pollution, which is still a very large problem in India. Uh, there are a few reasons for it. Uh, number one, I think it's, it is very much now uh, definitely high up on the company's agenda. So so as managers feel that they need to uh, to less engage with companies on that, it's going to more more recognized. And 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 we suspect that a lot of this. Uh, Really bad pollution is 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 coming out of the large corp is is less of an issue coming out of large corporates, but rather uh, out of the informal sector so in, uh, or at an individual level. Um, lastly, on the social issues here, I mean the big uh, uh, thing that you can see here is the I mean, obviously uh, human rights is 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 still very much the most uh, important aspect uh, ensuring. That, that the supply chains of companies are free of, of any kind of forced uh, labor. Uh, but, but you can see the huge change in importance uh, in, in, in data privacy. So, so the last uh, regulation that came out data privacy was in 2000. So, so the regulation is very out of date. Corporates obviously have been collecting a lot of uh, customer and employee data. And, and there is, it is inevitable that there's gonna be revamp in regulation and, and, and managers are very much on the case of, of making sure that companies are dealing with it uh, correctly. Thank you, Faisal. So Faisal's really captured some of the more meaty topics, uh, three of our key findings, and I'll deal with the last three. The first of those is few foreigners but outsized influence. We found it very surprising considering how big the Indian market is, how much interest there is, that there are so few foreigners involved in the local market. That doesn't mean they're not buying shares, Indian shares in global portfolios, but actually having asset management operations within the country. Many of them have tried and many have failed. India is broadly an unwelcoming uh, area for foreigners to come into. There's exchange control, red tape, bureaucracy, corruption. <clears throat> and so it's, because it's, a, it's a very difficult place to play. And almost all the managers that are there from a global perspective have done so by way of a JV, a joint venture with the local partner. But notwithstanding that, the influence of the outsiders is, is, is very, very clear and obvious. It's outsized in lifting standards through responsible investing. So there are a number of global investors in, in the local companies, many private, invest, uh, private equity investors in, in local companies as well. The, the clients of those global players are also demanding much better reporting um, disclosure standards. So they're forcing the local players to raise their game. I mentioned a bit earlier, the launch and the joining of many of the local managers to the principles for responsible investing, the PRI, and that too has compelled them to improve practices, the internal competencies, hire new teams, uh, subscribe to new data providers on a global basis, et cetera, et cetera. Our broad sense in the space is that progress has certainly been made, but the, the point made to us is there's a lot more left to be done. In terms of the, the authorities, there came clearly as a theme number five, 
The securities regulator SEBI uh, scores very, very highly. There was a very, very consistent comment that came through from all of our, from, from the different managers that we spoke to. Um, you know, over time, they've made incremental changes, which has been very, very positive. It's just been a regulator who kind of listens to comments and has done, uh, you know, has, has done a lot through time. Um, and, and the evidence of that is kind of quite clear. Um, one of the big reports that they released and required is a BRSR. So that would be the business um, responsible and sustainability report, which has led to far better disclosure through time. So that's one of the benefits of, of the, the new regulatory environment. And so those are two areas where big ticks were scored, but the latter one was the legal and tax systems were considered to be near the bottom of the class. Legal system is considered to be fair and objective, but cumbersome, slow. Some of the managers mentioned that legal cases can take over a decade to resolve, and in fact, not even resolve over the period of a decade. Tax systems were, were very problematic. Comments were made that there's almost not a single uh, Indian corporate that doesn't have some fight and, and conflict with the tax authorities, and many reasons for that, you know, a difficult and complex tax system, but also possibly um, some risk of tax avoidance or issues of, of, between, of the corporates themselves. Final point was to deal with proxy voting, and this is an area that India just excelled. The first point is it's fully automated and very effective. Um, in fact, in, in terms of the work that we've done, it was one of the best in all of the emerging markets, maybe even competitive with some developed markets. In South Africa, we spoke to managers a lot about the plumbing, the system around proxy voting. And here, the, the system works very, very well. Managers typically scored the Indian proxy voting system 10 out of 10, so 100% score. And we think there are other emerging markets that could well try and emulate this. SEBI also in 2010 mandated for all mutual fund managers that they had to have mandatory voting. So they vote on every single resolution that's put out there. And the mutual fund players control almost $500 billion of assets. They're the biggest player in the market. So this is very material that they do this. No abstentions are allowed. So you have to vote yes or no, and you have to vote on everyone. And then you also have to make that very publicly available so that the public can actually see what's been going on. Even the non-mutual fund managers said to us that they would pretty much vote on all their proxies, and then we tested on that, them on that. So in terms of whether they do exercise their proxy vote, you can see that 94% of the managers responded yes. There were only two which accounted for 6% who said no, and the reasons were the following. The first one had a separate segregated mandate where the manager did not have the discretion to vote that resided with the asset owner. So it was a fully understandable reason. And the second was a non-mutual fund manager who said that he was not under legal obligation to do so, but, but did so most of the time anyway. And then in terms of whether the companies have a policy that governs proxy voting, the answer was overwhelmingly yes. Again, when compared to some of the emerging market peers, we found this to be a very positive and standout score. So. Proxy voting, very big tech. In terms of uh, assessing the effectiveness of proxy voting, and these are scored from zero being terrible to five being excellent, the areas where um, they found it to be most, the managers found it to be most effective were executive compensation, diversity of the board and the independence of the chairperson, very much in line with some of the stats that uh, Faisal spoke to a little bit earlier in the discussion. The areas of weakness were around sustainability reporting, but expected to improve because the new BRSR has required, it's now mandatory from March of this year that the top 1,000 companies in India have to report this information. So we're going to be seeing some much better data coming out. And then related to that, uh, the area that they thought was least effective, disclosure of climate-related risks. So areas for improvement, but we have strong expectations that those improvements will be made. So that really concludes on the findings of our, study, of our, of our survey and our, our different research, et cetera. And a single slide then to talk about some suggestions for moving the needle forward. So there were six of those as well. And then the first one, and I'll, I'll go through each of them, is that we found that it takes courage to refrain from investing in companies that are controlled by bad actors. Courage from a two different perspectives. The one is that you have to stand up to 
often, you know, strong characters and, you know, characters on the wrong side of the law, whatever the case might be, but also as Faisal described as well, from a benchmark perspective, the ability, the strength of character to say we won't invest in that company, even if it's performing well, we found remarkable and commendable. And one thing to add to that as well is that the Indian stock market has 5,000 listed shares. Now, in fairness, only the top 1,000 really count. There are many companies at the bottom end that actually should be delisted, but those are it's complicated to delist a company. So, you know, so be it. But the truth of the matter is managers said to us they can afford to avoid a bad actor because there'd be another non-bad actor where they could put money to work and hopefully get as good a return. So we think that is excellent. We do encourage our managers to further nerve to invest and engage collaboratively for positive change. The second point was around calling out and censoring of the bad actors, trying to ensure that there's some appropriate consequence for such. It's a difficult area, it's not a simple area, but it would be very problematic for someone who is a bad actor to return to the markets a short time later in another, another guise. Now, most of the local players with, with their networks that Faisal had des described would, would know about that and watch him quite closely, but we think a bit more work could be done there. The third key suggestion was that we believe, and we've touched on this a bit, that asset managers can and should contribute positively and more to broader social issues or those that impact the wider sets of stakeholders. So, you know, diversity and gender and, and some of the other issues that uh, Faisal has spoken to. The S was the part when the big G, then came E, the S was very much left behind. Now, that is not unusual for emerging markets. We find that in China, we found that in South Africa as well, but nevertheless, we think more can be done. The fourth area is that the environmental issues are, are coming to the fore. We're gonna have much improved reporting coming forward. And therefore we think that asset managers can and should be upskilling their team so they can engage and contribute more on those different areas. They are doing that and, and we think that's sensible. Suggestion number five was about collaboration amongst asset managers. In the same way that Indian managers do not like to be confrontational, it's difficult for them to engage together other than on some climate issues. But we do think there may be opportunities to do so appropriately when to, to approach companies on some of the more sensitive issues. And then finally, our number six lesson suggestion to India, but to others, is that the Indian proxy voting system is praised as best in class. It's a, it's a world-class system. And we feel quite strongly that other markets, South Africa included, could benefit by adopting aspects or the entirety of the Indian template for proxy voting. So it's been a remarkable three and a half months. Uh, the team are thrilled with you know, the work done. I'm hoping that you benefit from this and get to look at the report. And on that note, uh, we're going to go into the Q&A session. I will stop sharing my screen and Faza will, will kick off with some of the first few questions. Uh, thanks, Glenn. I, I think uh, as, as a manager researcher, I, I found this survey and, and, and the findings really interesting. Just, just the way this dynamic of, uh, of how fund managers deal with these um, uh, uh, you know, majority stakeholders uh, is, is is, has been really, really interesting and, and comparing and contrasting why would you invest in this company but not in that company was, was very, you know, just demonstrating that it, 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 is, it is a very gray and subjective area and, and a very difficult one for fund managers uh, to deal with. Uh, and, a, and, a, and a question, uh, the first question that's come, come through is, is all exactly on that subject. So, so uh, by selling, uh, a manager is not losing a seat on the table. Uh, would it not be productive to escalate an engagement to achieve a specific outcome rather than divesting and completely losing one's voice? So there are a number of reasons why that is not happening yet, and it's 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 far less uh, frequent. Uh, one, definitely culture. Uh, two, really. Um, you know, some of these families um, who control their companies, they see this as their, as their companies and they will do whatever they feel like it uh, and, and are very likely to, to ignore you if anything get aggravated. 
uh, by uh, by a public uh, public dissent. So it it is seen in Indian society as counterproductive. Uh, and you know, we also had this in, you know, in Japanese society for many years where Western style engagement and activism share holding uh, uh, did not really work uh, in Japan for many, many years. And in that way, it is not, no, no different. And, 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 and really because, uh, because the potential risks that one has as a stakeholder, if, 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 if the majority stakeholder is about, is, is really digressing from what a fund manager thinks, uh, the action really is, is cut or sell uh, and potentially constructively continue engaging because uh, that, um, uh, but, you know, one can still hopefully on the smaller issues uh, uh, kind of address that. And then we've got, uh, we've got another question here. Uh, you mentioned that many families in the second and third generations uh, running companies are better towards ESG. How does that, how, how do attitudes change? The general trend is that 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 as the second generation comes in, they're more educated. Uh, they they know the they know the the actual uh, benefit uh, to the value, the long term value of the company by improving uh, better ESG and stewardship standards. Uh, they're more willing to be adoptive, communicate with shareholders, provide more information. That's definitely been the trend. Um, so, so, so absolutely, we, there is an evidence that 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 uh, these things improve uh, as the newer generations kind of become more dominant in in these uh, uh, long running family companies. Uh, Glenn, do you want to take take a few more? Yeah, no, I think it's very fascinating. When we speak to South African asset managers. It's a one hundred percent engagement. We have so few listed shares in, on the market that it's absolutely critical that you can't avoid any. And so engagement is, is number one priority. Yet in India, we heard such a different story. If you didn't like or didn't trust that management, you could afford to stay away because there's another thousand listed shares you could potentially you know, find opportunity from. So that came through as such a key theme and such a, like a key difference. So I thought that was kind of very important. There was a question asked as well, just in terms of the 29 questions that we asked of our managers. If you do want to see those that will be in the report, so there's a lot more detail than we've covered in today's presentation. And that report is available to everyone. So please do have a look at that. There was a question asked too, just in terms of, you know, would you make a standalone investment into India? I mean, India is a very exciting market as we've spoken about, huge growth, huge opportunities, wonderful returns. I mean, many of the asset managers are showing very strong alpha. So that's outperformance of benchmark because of the rigorous work that they do and avoiding some of these bad actors, et cetera. At the same time, we need to recognize that the Indian stock market is very expensive. It trades at a premium to the other emerging markets. So, for example, China is cheap in comparison and India expensive. So, as a value manager, it might be a preference for China over India. As a growth manager or growth investor, you'd certainly be looking more at India, which led to another question that we have here, just in terms of the interplay between China and India. You know, China went through a difficult period of time over three years, locking the economy down kind of very sharply, et cetera. Um, some of the challenges around the technology companies, you know, from a, from a top-down perspective, and quite a bit of money did leave China and move to India. So they are sibling rivalries. There's, there's rivalries on their borders. There are challenges between them, although they also have huge trade relationships between them. So the interplay of these two potential superpowers, we now have, you know, it's no longer the unipolar world of just United States, but China and India or superpowers in their own right, and that interplay over time is going to be very interesting. So we think an exposure to India is critical. There's just different ways to achieve. Hey, Glenn, we're having some connection issues from you. And the more, you know, kind of close. Baza, with any other questions, I have some other ones here, but let you go too. Yeah, I think we're having some connection issues that you're better now. Uh, so there's a question here from the audience. Any views on unlisted or private equity engagement uh, with, uh, any views on unlisted or private equity engagement with their targets? Um, it is, it, obviously, if, if, if one is in a controlling position uh, as a private equity investor, uh, typically uh, they tend to have more control on the corporate governance of companies. Uh, this did come up in the surveys where where 
private equity comp- owned companies make it to listed markets. Typically, the corporate governance would be more in line with what you would expect. Uh, you would ex- uh, potentially, certainly a separation of uh, CEO and chairman role, uh, fair representation on the boards, um, perhaps better readiness. Uh, I think when it comes to private e- equity investors, where they come from, uh, is, is they absolutely recognize that, that uh, if, if uh, they want to sell their stake, uh, and and a company could have some you know uh, bad uh, they were polluting waters that a buyer would might not want to take the stake uh, stake away from them if if if, if the uh, if they're not taking care of their employees and their strikes then they're going to struggle selling the stake uh, and same applies to governance and audit or audit procedures so so from that perspective private equity uh, owners have uh, got a very vested interest. Uh, on making sure all of these things are are, are done properly in, in in the companies that they take over, they often have those discussions very much before they invest, uh, and and it's often co- contractual at at the time they make that investment. And typically, you will get better implementation uh, in in those cases. And and fund managers who invest in listed equities have seen that as those companies come to listed markets. Probably time for our last question. And apologies, I believe I was cutting out in the. The China versus India one, if anyone wants me to repeat it, I can do. Question was asked, how successful are asset managers when engaging with smaller family-led companies in the small and mid-cap space? It is kind of interesting because um, some of the managers we spoke to would buy a share and hope to hold it for 10 or 20 years and have done so. So you really want to do some really great due diligence up front to make sure you're backing the right management team. And often those smaller companies realize they don't have all the skills that they require and they were actually quite happy to have a stronger engagement and better and more involved engagements um, with the asset managers and benefit from those. Um, so yes, there's kind of a mix. Some of those promoter families are not interested and in kind of do their own things, but many can be quite engaged and actually embrace that. And Faz also spoke earlier about the generational change. That's very right. clear. As the next generation comes in, you find they're much more engaging, they're much more professional, they're much more exposed to ESG. They may be less entrepreneurial. Glenn, if we could just take one more, let's come to the audience and venture capital in India. Uh, uh, I think that's a really interesting area. So, so uh, for the first time ever, there's a whole sway of, of unicorns that are expected to be exited out of India. Uh, there has been a lot of excitement. Uh, about venture capital in India, and and uh, I, I think I mean with the the pinch of salt uh, which comes with investing in venture capital, there's got to be the right brands, the the right networks, the brands to be able to ability to attract the best companies. Uh, so you've got all the natural caveats uh, when it comes to venture capital investing in India as well. But but really, yeah, I think I think I think the, uh, some of the best venture capital funds have been ability to demonstrate. Uh, companies uh, to create companies and make them sizable, uh, which are due to come onto listed markets soon. Uh, so it's an interesting area, um, but but still largely not as dominant as, for example, in China. I mean, the, the reality status play is that the current standing two uh, global uh, venture capital markets are Silicon Valley and, and 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 China. But but we are seeing venture capital emerge in other areas, and they are looking promising. Faisal and everyone else, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, A special thanks to our asset managers that we engaged with in India. Um, It was a fantastic level of engagement. Many of us supported in this morning session today. And so a special thanks to all of you. And um, there are contact details available. Um, We we had on the screen Bernadette's contact details or others should be fairly easy on LinkedIn otherwise to get hold of us. So thank you all for your time. I hope you enjoyed and benefited. And uh, hopefully till the next one in 2024. All the best.